Turn to Genesis chapter 4, and we are continuing to discover the ways of Cain. <clears throat> the way of Cain. And I'm going to read um, <clears throat> verse 6, and then... Um, Part of verse 8, first part of verse 8. All right. Genesis 4, verse 6, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou angry? Why is thy countenance fallen? And then verse 8, And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother. <clears throat> So, we, last uh, time we met together, we were talking about these attributes of Cain. <clears throat> and um, we need to really comprehend um, that we are not just talking about the way of Cain. We're not just talking about the way of Cain. <clears throat> we're talking about someone that the Bible, that the Lord of the Bible, that God, before there was a Bible, um, would see as a contrast of Christ. Okay, that's, that's important <clears throat> because uh, we're not just pointing out people's wrong, whether it's Cain or anybody else. We're not just pointing out they're wrong. We're not doing that. God's not doing that by putting this story in there. <clears throat> um, God has something that he wants to bring us into, and it's in relationship to his son. And he, he can deal with us personally um, in positive ways or in negative ways or in the law of contrast to show us, well, this is not only not my son, this is clearly in contrast to my son. This is a contrast of my son. So <clears throat> what that means is that God is, not just, God is not just using the story of Cain and Abel and particularly the attributes and the way of Cain to, um, you know, to get us out of something, try to get you out of this way, this thought pattern, this... Uh, he's not doing that. He's, he is using that as a contrast because it, of Christ because it would be way more powerful if it were seen as a contrast of Christ than it would be, well, this is wrong, don't do it. Does anybody agree with that? That's, a, that's the deal. And if a person has a heart for the Lord, if they, if they do love the Lord, it doesn't matter what level of of maturity uh, a person is in because at the at the center for us as as believers at the center of all other things should be that we have a heart for the lord that we love the lord that 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 is there therefore just pointing out the attributes of cain as negative would have no bearing on that except to say, well, these are, God doesn't want us to do this, you know. And whether it's Cain or anybody, really, I, that would be seen sort of in a negative light in the scriptures, it wouldn't be as powerful to us if we only saw it. As, and not only that, it would probably be a bad lesson to us if all we saw is God's pointing out somebody's problems. Because then what would we do? We would do, well, we'd do that anyway. But anyway, we would, in fact, we are doing that anyway, whether we've seen that. <clears throat> but when we see it in light of, when we see Cain in light of, this is the exact opposite of the nature and the way of the Lord. That is the way, the Lord who is the way. Um, then it can reach our heart for Jesus. Then the Spirit of God can come down on that 
and, and by drawing a contrast of our attitudes and our ways and our things that would match up with, with Cain, it would be drawing a contrast of us as strongly as Cain to Christ. And from that should draw something toward the Lord instead of, you know, just seeing, well, that guy's a bad guy. Thank God I'm a good guy. You know, and, and we're not. We need Christ formed in us. We need the cross. We need the things that are in God's heart pertaining to his son before the foundation of the world. We don't just need to learn what's wrong, and we don't even need to learn what's right. We need to learn Christ, and he will fulfill. We, Jeff and I were talking about that. You know, Christ will be the one who fulfills that instead of uh, in enlisting in a religion that demands that you act and be a certain way, which even if you do, you would, you know, you would not be, you would no longer, if you followed the, the outlines and the rules of, of a denomination or whatever, and you followed it perfectly, maybe you would no longer be seen as a heathen or a sinner, but you might be seen as a Pharisee. And Jesus kind of hung out with the sinners, but he, he rebuked the Pharisees. <clears throat> because of why? Because it was a wrong picture of the reality that God was trying to bring about, and yet they were using the things of God to produce that, to, to, to make it acceptable. Um, the father wants his son. Period. He could have saved us from hell. He could have made us Christian without putting his son in us. He couldn't really. I mean, I guess he could have made us Christian, but he wouldn't have made us what he wanted. <clears throat> and then we'd go back to the other religion. But he didn't just die on a cross and say, there, you're saved, and you're not going to go to hell, and then shoot up to heaven but instead, God put his son in us. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Isn't that interesting? The hope of glory is not Christ coming back in the clouds. It's that his son may be in us and live in us. Not I, but Christ. And that captivate us. That... Um, draw us out of not, not just sin and failure, draw us out of self-righteousness. Um, man at his best is altogether vanity, it says in Psalms. Our righteousness is, is filthy rags. It doesn't say our, our our badness, we, I think many people quote that, and they're thinking, well, all of my sin is as filthy rags. He said, your righteousness is as filthy rags. And that's supposed to, like, slap us in the face because when we're first born again, we're trying to run from sin. We're, or, you know, we're trying to escape from sin. We're trying, that's what it's all about. It's all about getting away from sin so that we can be acceptable to God. Um, and... What if Cain never did any sin except for kill his brother for the reasons that he killed his brother? That's the worst sin of all. And, you know, it, it, even Pilate, it says that he knew that, he, that they had brought him up on charges because of jealousy. And so... <clears throat> um, the Spirit of God wants to fall on this story and take us out of some sort of a, this is the good guy, Jesus, or Abel, and this is the bad guy over here. No, that's why Jesus, when he was there with Moses and Elijah, and the, as it were, the top three apostles, and it looked great because you've got the best of the best, God, when God the Father shows up, he overshadows everybody except Jesus. And it says only Jesus was seen. 
And the voice says, this is my beloved son. Man, that's, that should shake our religion. You know, that should shake our religion. So it's really important that we, as, as we go through uh, and continue to go through in dealing with Cain, that we, we see, whatever we see of the attributes, attributes of Cain or what was described in the book of Jude as the way of Cain, um, if the Holy Spirit is able at all to put his finger on anything pertaining to us that is in relationship to those things, we need to see it as a contrast of what God wants through Christ. What God wants, what the Father wants, the Father wants this beloved son over Moses, over Elijah, over the great, great lawgiver, over the, the great prophet. And it's just a son. It's a son. It's not a, 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 there's no title in that sense, you know. Um, whereas the others carry a very heavy, big title. Moses, the lawgiver. The man who brought Israel out of Egypt. Uh, Elijah, standing up for God. All the things, all the things that we admire in the best of them. God still overshadows not just the, the uh, attributes of them, but them. You know? And he says, this, this right here, this. He, he goes, you know, I know that you wouldn't have got it if you could still see each other. Because I said this, and you said, was he pointing at me? Is it me, Lord? But he overshadowed it with a cloud so when he said this <laughs> we go oh okay it's unmistakable it's his son and he put his son in us and he didn't put his son in us so that we would be um, one of the top religionists in the land or in the church he put his son in us so that that nature and that life that pleases God in its humility and its self-giving would be manifest and that and that was why he called us his body his body we're the body of Christ his body so that he could manifest forth that glory that glory all right so I wrote, if you do not see these things as hindrances to Christ in you, then again, you have missed the point pertaining to the things of Cain. If you don't see that, if you see it in, at work in you on any level, but you don't see that as a, a stone wall that is hindering the life of Christ to come forth because he would never come forth in that manner, then we've missed the point. We've missed the mark. And the mark is Christ, the Son of God, the firstborn. All right. So in the last, um, last time, last class, we talked about several of those attributes. One was that we talked about that Cain cannot bear public humiliation and shame. I don't think there was a lot of public there, but he still couldn't bear it, you know. That it was like, this is too much. And he says stuff like that. This is too much for me. This is too much for me. I cannot, you know. And again, we remember we talked about this. That's too much for you? you killing your brother is not too much for you? Hating him or, or, or knowing that he was God's choice, which we'll deal with a little more hopefully soon. Um, I can't accept that, so I have to accept that he is not God's choice. And that God wants me to, or whatever. 
or I will, I will deal with this and right the situation. The situation. Um, and Cain believes that in maintaining his, his rights and that the maintenance of his rights is the definition of justice. Therefore, the lack of maintaining his rights is the definition of injustice. Okay? Man, how far can we get from the Lord? How far can we get from his very being, his nature? Call him our God, but, you know. And then also, um, inequality is heinous. Now, that only applies when you're looked upon as you, you, you're not getting the equality of the others or the other because you would not want, if you were Cain, you would not want others to be equal with you in your whatever, your firstborn rights, which is why he killed Cain. And then, of course, <clears throat> the final one we talked about, I think it was the final one, is that who is the best deserving one? Who is the deserving one? Who best deserves this, this position, this status? Um, <clears throat> you know, none of us deserve anything. I mean, if this really is by grace, we don't deserve anything. Right? We don't deserve it. It's by grace, but it's not just by grace. It is by the gracious nature of the Lord. So let's give the glory to the gracious nature of the Lord and not to just magical grace. It's by grace. It's by grace. Thank you for grace. No, thank you for the gracious nature of the Lord that extends it. Why do we have to make a religious substance out of it and call it grace and, and allude to it regularly without any real thought of this is how he is and this is how he gives and this is how he pours out. And, he and, the, and the definition of grace for us, especially in relationship to being saved and all of that is the cross, his death on the cross. That's how it came to us, that, you know, but, there, but somehow there's a grace without the cross. And, and eventually there can be a grace without a God. It's just there's grace. Oh, Lord, give me more grace. Give, you know, give me more grace for me. Okay, Lord, give me more favor than the rest of the body of Christ. No. <laughs> I paused too long. <laughs> Some of you are going, yes. <laughs> no. We are one, and that grace came from one who died on the cross, and it's equal to all. But he is not equal to all because he is according to the heart of the Father, not according to him, according to the heart of the Father. He didn't exalt himself. God exalted him to his right hand, that selfless one, the one who died, the one who gave himself. All right, so um, God's measure then, because we just looked at the attributes of Cain, God's measure is different than Cain's and you can be assured that God's measure is different than ours. You can be assured of that. You can be assured that we need more alignment. You know, we have scoliosis of the spirit. We, we, we need more alignment with him. And I, you know, I'm, I'm just hoping you're all really warm tonight in here. It seems hot to me. You know, I realize that when I, I share, when you stand up, hot air rises, and so it's like, 
and I'm and maybe it'll stop right here. And I'm going, is it hot in here? No, it's cool down here. <laughs> um, so uh, God's measure is never based on our rights. Never based on our rights. It's always based on his firstborn son. Okay? And that means, and then Paul said it, he said it well. I have learned, it, it, it took me a while. Don't you get that when he says, I have learned? It took me a while, but I have learned that in whatever state I find myself to be content. I have learned to be abased, down. I've learned to be, and I've learned to be content because all things work together for good. All of it works. It's the all things. It's a, and it does. And it does, but it only works for those who want to be conformed to the image of Christ. And when you do, then the abasement, uh, maybe, maybe the Lord knows that you need to be brought down a couple of notches, you know, which really means what? You need more Jesus formed in you. That's what it means. <clears throat> Um, so he brings about a circumstance that will do that. Now, I will tell you that if you would like to do this, it would really uh, edify you. If you start going through the Bible, if you just start going through the Bible and you start looking, uh, and fairly soon we're going to be through with Cain and Abel and we're going to deal with uh, Abraham and Isaac and Ishmael, uh, you certainly see it in, in Abraham's life. Every time the Lord would appear and would say something of the great promises that he, he had for him and for his seed, whether the seed was there yet or not, Abraham would build an altar, which is wonderful, but then the next circumstances that came looked like God didn't really, wasn't going to do that at all. He's just messing with you. Really, I mean, it's, it blew my mind when I started going through it and kept going and going, oh, man, you know, we're talking about the faith of Abraham. When it's, it's going contrary, and then you, you have to stay with the Lord in it. Never doubt in darkness what you've seen in light. Don't doubt in darkness what you have seen in light. Just because darkness comes has not changed what you've seen when you had light. Unless you change. You know, I remember, I remember years ago, the thought came to me, okay, what am I going to do in this situation? God said this, the devil's messing with me with this. And I kind of looked at it and said, you know, God's not going to change because the Bible says God never changes. I looked at the devil and I said, you know what? He's not going to change. And it occurred to me like a light went off. I'm going to have to change. I'm going to have to be with the Lord and not be moved by dark and light, by God or the devil or the base or abound or any of this stuff. I'm gonna, I am going to be with a hymn, and I'm not talking about a song. I'm talking about Jesus. I'm going to be with him. Well, I know that's not as easy as it sounds, but you, it is possible. Does that help? <laughs> it's possible. It is possible for some of the worst things to come to you, and you just be with him. Lord, I thank you that whatever comes by your hand, I thank you for it. I trust you. And, you know, trust is a big deal because trust says that I don't trust my perceptions. I trust yours, yours because they proceed from you. So you're not even glorying in his glorious perceptions. You're glorying in him and what proceeds out from him. 
but it always goes back to a him first, not what is his or what he does or, you know. And that's the, that's the thing of the heart. It's a thing of the heart. When you get in religion, you are, you, there are so many subjects in the Bible, you know. Um, you know, I remember, you know, uh, and I'm pretty sure this was back in Bible school too. You know, uh, one teacher would be talking about world evangelization and we need to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And another one who had a big family would be teaching on, on the family. And the, the family is the most important thing. It is the cornerstone of da-da-da-da. And another one would be teaching on prayer, you know. And so, he's, so the last class I'm in, or, or, he says, pray without ceasing. And I'm going, well, then I don't have time for these other things. And there's a bunch more. And I'm just frustrated because I'm trying to evangelize and I'm trying to pray without ceasing and I'm trying to, you know, do this and that. And it's just like, I can't do it. And, you know, and here was the picture that I had. Okay, I'm, I'm juggling with two balls first, you know, okay. I can handle this, you know. And then, you know, pray without ceasing, okay, you know. And then someone says, hey, you know, the Lord goes, hey, pitch that to him, you know. And then, oh, 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 and then you go, how am I keeping on? <laughs> okay, God. Amen. You say, why would the Lord allow me to get in such a frustrating situation? Because he wanted to teach you that it's not about all of the subjects of the Bible. It's about a him. It's about Jesus. It's about Christ and Christ in you. Because he already had Christ before the foundation of the world. He already had his son before the foundation of the world. So the only new addition was to build an environment, a, a stage, a set, a movie set called Earth. To build a movie set, put us in there. And then put Christ in us and see how we handle the, the things that, you know, each scene brings. And a lot of times we don't do so well. Because for us it's not first about him. It, even if it's the up there real high about his. Well, this is the, and this is where a lot of people really get off in the, the spirit and nature of Cain. I'm just defending his truth. I'm defending the truth of God. Your doctrines are wrong. Mine are right. I'm defending the truth. Okay. I don't know how you can defend that truth if with that spirit. Well, actually, I do know how you can do it. Uh, number one, it's Cain, and number two, it's still off from the true target, the true goal. It's not him. It's still, even if it's his, you know. And I, I remember, I mean, you know, almost everything that I share with you, I remember my failure in that. I remember standing up and going, you know, no, no, it's this and it's that, and it's not that over there that you're teaching, or this and that, and that's wrong, and you're leading people astray and all this kind of stuff. I remember feeling that and feeling, you know, uh, I've got to stand up for God. And one day it was as if the Lord spoke to me and he said, I don't need anybody to stand up for me. I'm just fine. <laughs> you know, they can rant and rave and the heathen can rage. I'm still the same and everything that I've set forth is going to be the same. Now, how about you change and get with the same? Yeah. You know? But we're, you know, oh, my God, I need to really do something here. Yeah, you need to reckon yourself dead and then let the life that is within you, he will, if he, if Jesus really is life in us, don't you think life can produce actions or thoughts or words? Or even stronger, the lack of words? That's even stronger. Because, you know, you know us. We got to say, I got to say something. I got to release this. I got to, you know, <laughs> we all do it. 
if we all do it. I got to release this. This is, this, is a, this is a seed that needs to go into their ground. You know, and you, without realizing that we're all professional ball players that know how to bat those seeds right away. You know what I'm saying? We will. We, you know, hockey players, we block the, we're good goalies. We block it all, man. <clears throat> well, then what's going to get through? I'll yell louder. <laughs> you know, they'll have to do something. <clears throat> no, no. How about get lower? How about going to death and believe that death brings forth life? His death. His death working in you. Death worketh in me, but life in you. Okay, well, we've all heard that, right? At least once over the, I don't even know how many years I've been preaching anymore. <laughs> but if you've been around me, you've heard it at least more than three times. Because... I, I tried it all, and I saw it didn't work. And I, when I would see things wrong or out of whack or whatever, I've tried to fix stuff. And finally, I realized, you know, just shut up and go into death. Just be with, with him in his death. Just be with me, the Lord would say. And let me produce it through my means instead of through your means. Okay, well, you know, I'm a little bit in there now. <laughs> I'm trying to get in more. <clears throat> All right, so we're seeing, and I, boy, this, wow. We just need to realize. And we're going to see, we're going to see this spirit going throughout Genesis, we're going to see it over and over in every story. We're going to see the same thing, but different, different little attributes that a certain person brings or whatever. But <clears throat> when we rise up, we're saying we're the firstborn. And we're not. We're Cain or we're Ishmael or we're, you know, those things. So I wrote uh, with Cain and Abel, I said, in Cain and Abel, we see a similar thing happen between the twins. No, we're not talking about Zeke and Levi. I'm talking about Esau and Jacob. Between Esau and Jacob. Esau assumed the right belonged to him by reason of birth order. But Esau need not forget that he was the one who sold his birthright to Jacob long before the deception of his younger brother. Am I right or wrong? Or is the Bible right or wrong? He, he sold his birthright long before Jacob pulled his little trick. But that does not matter to him. It plays no part in the equation. Okay, so what does that mean? Now that's, that's, that right there is a good example of being baseball players that can knock away those seeds or goalies that can stop the Lord from making a goal in our heart. And that is <clears throat> that Esau, though he knew that he sold his birthright to his younger brother because he was hungry, he could come up with an equation and come up with the equals without putting that in the equation. And now it's just all Jacob is unfair. That's all. That's what the deal is. That's what the deal is. And, uh, and of course, I've said this a million times, but self-deception, we, we deceive ourselves, and the scriptures say more about self-deception than the devil deceiving us. We do that because we are maintaining our rights. We do that because we think that there is something worthy in us that needs to uh, be acknowledged or blessed or seen as more than what uh, everybody else is or something like that, you know. 
I mean, my example to myself right off the bat, I first got saved, I, when I first got saved, I wasn't a year old, and I determined I was going to become a great evangelist, a great one. And I, I chose that because um, I had been working a few months in Kenneth Copeland's ministry before he got famous. But I saw all the money that was coming in. I wanted to be a great, I didn't want to be a missionary because then they'd be poor and outcast or whatever. And I sure didn't want to be a pastor, which when I graduated from Bible school, I became a missionary and on the mission field, I became a pastor in several churches. <laughs> so be careful what you wish for. <laughs> be careful what you wish for. So there's that, <clears throat> that, blocking thing when the when in our mind we're writing out the equation and then we come up with Jacob needs to die Abel needs to die needs to be dealt with needs to be removed needs to be okay how about this I won't kill him but Lord you bring him down major and particularly if you can do it so that they'll be humiliated in front of all <clears throat> Anybody ever thought something like that toward someone else? Thank God, look, I am in such a holy place tonight. I feel, I feel, <laughs> well, then that would be you and me. <laughs> Praise God. So, um, I, you know, I really would like to get past this equation thing. But it is absolutely clear in the scriptures that Esau sold his birthright. And he did it to feed his belly, to feed his flesh. That was more important than this. And he held on to everything but that and never brought that into the fact. Okay. In Esau's view, the only issue was one thing. Jacob duped their father into giving him the firstborn blessing and because the first and became the firstborn, uh, though he was actually a secondborn instead of he was the firstborn like Esau. Uh, in the following words, we have described Esau's inner reaction that caused him to contemplate Jacob, uh, putting Jacob to death. From this, we can have an example of what might have transpired in the heart of Cain prior to killing Abel. So this is Genesis 27. If you want to turn there, you can read it with me. Genesis 27, we're going to look at verse 41 through 45. <clears throat> and as I said, this is, this is going to relate the things going on in Esau, okay? Verse 41, Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith the father blessed him. Okay, you see that? Do you see what it says? He hated him because the father blessed him, uh, and I am sure he thought, what a stupid old man that he was fooled by Jacob. Um, so this is uh, 27, 41 through 45. And, um, and he's made it this thing. He hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. Because of what the father did in relationship to another son. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand, which they weren't. He thought he was going to die. They all thought he was going to die. He's on his deathbed. Jacob uh, goes down into Haran, and I don't know how many, I don't remember how many years, but he was there a long time and came back and his father was still alive and his mom had died. But old dad hadn't kicked the bucket yet. Excuse my text. Um, so the, uh, Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother. And these words of Esau uh, her elder son were told to Rebekah, and she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau, as touching thee, doth comfort himself, purposing to kill thee. All right, so there are different forms of comfort. 
comfort, there's comfort food. There's uh, comfortable furniture, bed, or, or couch. And there's comforting yourself by killing your brother. That's what it says. All right. Uh, but I, see, what I believe is that we don't get Jesus' words who said, when you, if you have, you know, ought against your brother without a cause, that, and you, that it's the same as murder. Because maybe we've actually never contemplated murder, but he didn't say contemplating murder. He said, letting this ought and this stuff build up in you against your brother is a violation of the cross and the nature of Christ and the plan of God and the very heart of what the Father had for you in the first place. And you've allowed it to control your life, at least for that period of time and probably in everything, but just that's the big piece, the resistance of the big meal that you're serving your flesh. Um, but I believe that this is one of those examples of what Jesus was talking about. Why? Well, I'll, I will say because it was without a cause because uh, he had already sold it, but there's another reason that we'll get to in just a minute. Maybe. And... Um, I'll read that again. Behold, thy brother Esau, as touching thee, doth comfort himself, purposing to kill thee. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee thou to Laban, my brother, in Haran, and tarry with him a few days. You know, it takes a while to get the fires of that junk down in Esau. But when we get there, you'll find out that it wasn't length of days. It was what the only thing that could deal, deal with it. And tarry with him a few days until thy brother's fury uh, turns away, turn away. Until thy brother's anger turn away from thee and he forget that which thou hast done to him. Then I will send and fetch thee from thence. Why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? Okay, so she said that uh, he, we're going to do this for some days until he forget what you've done to him. <clears throat> I'm trying to remember the story here, but it seemed to me like mom had something to do with this. Oh, yeah, she came up with the plan. <laughs> hmm, okay, but she's pointing to him now, huh? You, what you did. Buddy, you better, yeah, I taught, I've taught you better than this, except for when I taught you that. <laughs> Anyway, it's still your fault because you did it. You know, you pulled the trigger. All right, so. So <clears throat> here we have uh, Cain or Esau ready to do what Cain did because Cain was first and then Esau. And He's going to kill his brother, and he's going to do it for basically the same reason that Cain did. Um, in his anger, his intent was to kill his brother for taking away what rightfully was his. Anybody see that thing of rights again? It's, it's my right. This is, therefore, this is not right. If I don't get my rights, this is not right. Well, it's a very simple statement but I wish we would get it. It's not right because I'm not getting my rights. That's wrong. <laughs> There's a way that seems right, but it's really the ways of death. Amen? It seems right because it's my rights have been violated but it's the ways of death, and somebody died. Abel died. He has been 
talking about Cain or Andy. So he has been wronged in the same manner as Cain and likened unto the elder son in the prodigal son story in that a younger brother has received God's favor and blessing and become the illegitimate firstborn. First of all, if God says they're the firstborn or that that's the firstborn son I want, then that settles it. It doesn't matter what anybody says or thinks or whatever spiritual truths we think that we have that are really uh, conceived in, in darkness and, and are the ways of death. God's the only one that counts. When it comes to relationship with his son, he can spot the difference. He can smell the difference. He can, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Isaac, the old man there, couldn't smell the difference. He smelled what smelled like Esau, but he couldn't smell the firstborn. He could smell the one that he thought was the firstborn. Because remember, he's, he was the one who said, yeah, he's the firstborn. And the mom said, no. And, of course, I'm jumping way ahead here. But when we get there, whoo! There's way more stuff that's really cool in this story. <clears throat> the elder son sees it as a great wrong and, and what? Unfair. All capitals and in red on my, my thing. And I had somebody write me a text. Oh, it was perfect. Can I use their name? Oh, man, I loved it. I got, a, I got a text, and it was from Patty, and she, and she <laughs> it was so perfect. And in it, it was, she's just sharing the Lord, and she's just really, you know, seeking the Lord. Yeah, no, no, well, that's fine. But, she, but in that, she used the word unfair, and she put it in red. And I went, she got it. She got it. Yeah. <laughs> That so blessed me. Okay, so the elder son sees it as a great wrong and unfair because someone who appears lesser is put before the wiser and better. Well, you know, if we were all lowly, if we were all, and we just let him raise or fall according to what he wants to, at any time he wanted to, up, down, a, a base, a bound, I'm going to keep testing you. You know, well, I passed one, I should be exalted. <laughs> you know, it's going to take more than that, buddy. It's going to take a long time, okay? Fasten your seatbelt because it's going to be a while. When Esau cries out to his father to give him the birthright, Isaac reminds him that the birthright has already been bestowed on another, and there's nothing he can do about it. What is done is done. So this is Genesis, uh, this is still Genesis 27, but verse 37. And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, okay, so this is the father after Esau's complaining. Behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants. And with corn and wine have I sustained him, and what shall I do now unto thee, my son? It's, it's tough when you realize that you're not really what it's all about, that Jesus is. It's also tough if, if God seems to, I'm going to say it like this, God seems to anoint somebody as the firstborn son because they, he sees something of the life there, and we react to that because we don't see that the father has bestowed that on upon his son, even if it be for a moment. See, we have to be instant in season and out of season all the time with the Lord. We have to be ready to be abased or to abound. We have to be ready to, to acknowledge or say that, you know, I'm with you, Father, in not going with that or whatever. It's, it, it's him. It's about him. We have the Son in us. We give the Father the Son in abasement or in bounding or in... Uh, his judgment at the moment. And you know that. I mean, I've shared that many times about David. He went out to, he's getting ready to go out to do battle with the Philistines. And he said, Lord, what do we do? And he told him exactly what to do. And then and they went out and defeated him. And the next day, the ones that were left over came back to fight again. And he didn't say, well, let's use the same tactics because I heard this yesterday. And 
it's got to be still good today. He said, Lord, what would you have me do? And he gave him a completely different thing. We're not checking in because we don't have the son that's, who checks in. I do always those things that please the Father at every moment. I want to be with the Father. Okay. But there's another view, and so, so we're going to get we're going to finish with this. There's a there's another view we left out of this in relationship to Jacob and Esau. So, but there's another view to be considered. As mentioned, Esau sold that birthright of his own free will, right? Free will. But there's still another greater consideration. Even though at birth, God had already declared which of the two would be his choice for firstborn. Anybody remember that? At birth, at the birth of Jacob and Esau, God said, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. At the very beginning, in the, they were twins. So we're talking about at the immediate birth order coming forth, he changed it. Oh, my Lord. Even though at birth God had already declared which one of the two would be his choice for firstborn, Esau claimed the birthright by reason of birth order. He stuck with the natural order, the natural order of things. But Esau was replaced by God himself by what God's choice was. Of course, be reminded that this all happened according to God's choice. The elder shall serve the younger. This is in Genesis 25, and this is also in Romans 9. And if you want to know the true meaning in Romans 9, you'll have to wait till we get there because it's all tied up right here in the firstborn. The firstborn. So we see that the same issues are at work in Cain Esau and the elder brother of the prodigal son story, and they are still alive and at work in people today. All right. Father, bless your word with the presence of the Holy Spirit and the movement of his wings, as it were, in our hearts to be able to give that which is living. Uh, Jesus, you said your words are not just to be obeyed. They are spirit and life, and that's what you want them to be in us. And yet we're trying to keep the letter of the law instead of being with you, Jesus, in what you said your word was going to be. So help us to break and to be molded and to um, be with you pertaining to your son for every resistance is a resistance against you and your desire to get your son as we try to become the firstborn within our own power and strength. So Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you, continue to break us down that you might build us up that you might build us up in Christ, that, that he might be the head of the corner and that we all be fastened together into that one and that we be seen as together in that one and not in our own righteousness. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.